So I'm glad uh, for the good balance you can have in a church like this. And um, yesterday, uh, and Lord's been good to me. Most of these preachers have been on life support, you know, this year and laid off left and right, donate buttons, you know, for GoFundMe ministries. I mean, they've been hurting. But God's been awfully good to me. I've only been out of the pulpit on uh, two Sundays. I've only been out of the pulpit two Sundays all year. I was kicked out of the Philippines and kicked out of an Indian reservation twice in New Mexico. The Lord's been uh, good to me. I've packed up the rest of the year, even on every Wednesday at the end of the year. So God's been, I'm so thankful for that. And uh, yesterday I mentioned it was so, cra so crazy to see those 600 trucks and fire trucks and motorcycles and everything, with thousands of Trump signs. I, I don't know. I can't hardly see a a Joe Biden sign anywhere. So I saw, saw one on, a, on Facebook the other day with a dog lifting his leg up, you know. I, 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 it was terrible. But, uh, you know, we're, we're probably so spoiled and don't understand it yet. So let's just keep asking the Lord to help us. But yesterday there was a, um, a car zipped through those 600 vehicles, two black ladies in it with a gigantic Black Lives Matter black flag flying out of the off the car, and on the second, they came this way, and then on the way back, they're flipping the bird to all of us. And so tonight, I'm going to speak on this subject, Black Lives Matter, and you don't even want to think of missing that message, because uh, I'm going to come in this thing through the back door and give you a real blessing. And some of you teenagers heard the message, I think, up there at, um, for the duties, had a different title then, but uh, so you just have to act spiritual and act like you're getting the blessing a second time around. All right? Uh, I'm going to speak a, a, a quite a bit this morning out of this book, How Satan Turned America Against God. You have it in the uh, bookstore. I want to recommend that you think about getting copies of that book to people you know right now, because it deals with everything Trump's fighting tonight, and people don't have a clue why things are like they are. You know, the subtitle says, um, A Scriptural Examination of Conspiracy History. So that, that's a subject that the Bible deals with extensively. And uh, Joseph's brothers conspired against him. That's the first mention of the word in the Bible. Anyway, you might want to, you know, I was on an airplane yesterday sitting next to an airline pilot, and he's a, graduated from PCC, if you can believe that, in Pensacola. And we had an hour and a half talk about everything, and he was dumbfounded. He said, I never heard that. I never heard that. I never, Baptist history, King James material, everything. I gave him, I had, I had a copy given by inspiration in my bag. He grabbed that thing. I, I gave it to him as a blessing. And I'll be preaching in Calhoun, Georgia, Monday and, and Tuesday. And he lives 15 minutes from the church. And you know, though you know, he said, God must have brought us together. Spooky. So you can help people by passing material on to them that they have no clue about. But uh, think about that because it's a hot subject right now. All right, turn in your Bibles to um, Job chapter 24. I don't want to continue along the theme of this morning's Sunday School lesson about current events and having the Bible put a light on it. And I want to give you a, a beautiful four-point outline this morning God gave me about four or five months ago in the height of all this nonsense. And again, God's been so good to me since I saw you right in the height of all this stuff. I had what I called my Corona Crusade. I, you won't believe this, but I spoke uh, 30 times in 27 days in 16 churches, one stretch, 13 churches in New York State. And we were dodging Cuomo's black helicopters and everything else, and three other churches in Pennsylvania. And it's been a wonderful run, and God gave me this material about that time, and I haven't been here, I don't think, since then. So this should be, be new to you. All right, why don't we stand for a seventh inning stretch at Job 24, just one verse. And if you read this verse the wrong way, you're gonna get the exact opposite of the meaning of the verse. It all depends on where you pause, uh, and you'll see that in just a second now. Why, comma, Job scratching his head here. Ready? He's in a dilemma. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? That's the correct way to read it. Do you realize if you pause, if you go past him and pause it not? I mean, if you, go, if you don't pause it, no. Wait a minute. Duh. If I mess up anymore, I stuttered a couple months ago, and I never do that. I stuttered bad for some reason. 
And, and I felt stupid for a split second, and the Holy Spirit said, tell him it's your Joe Biden impersonation. <laughs> I promise you he told me that, and I told him, and I've been using that line ever since. You say, God didn't tell you that. Don't you have fun with the Lord? Now, I'm not trying to be carnal, but Crocodile Dundee, me and God are mates. I don't know if you remember that line. I'm close enough to God. I have fun with him plenty of times. There's enough depression out there. Do you know the Lord enough to have fun with him? And um, anyway, uh, watch it now. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him, that's where you pause, not see his days. You can go past him and pause it not. For those that know him not, right, see his days. You could read it that way if you didn't pause at the right word and you get the exact opposite meaning. You know what that verse is? How many of you think God knows what's going on? Amen. A black preacher preached a sermon one time, did it ever occur to you that nothing occurs to God? We've all heard that expression. He knows what he's doing. Well, well let me ask you this. How, do, do most of you know the Lord? How many of you married folks are married to each other, but you don't know each other as well as you should maybe, even though you're still married to each other? A lot of saved people are married to the Lord. They're as part of his bride, but they don't spend any time with him, so they don't really know his thinking. That's why Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, right? So you know what Job's saying? How come if God knows what's going on, how come the folks that know God don't know what's going on? That's exactly what he's asking. You jump over to 2 Chronicles, don't look there, but over in chapter 12, verse 32, the children of Issachar were, were commended for being ch uh, ch uh, children with understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Over there in Matthew 16, the first four verses, Jesus balls the Pharisees out because they can read the signs of the weather, but they can't see the signs of the times prophetically. He's having all the people sit down in the green grass to feed them. Here's Psalm 23, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He said, you can't see, that's a picture of me, where are you at? You know, Jack Hiles used to say there's three kinds of people in the world. The first group of people makes things happen. The second group of people watches things happen, and the third group of people don't know what's happening. That's most of the Christians I know, that third group. Their life's verse is a question mark. I used to say uh, it was a dial tone, but now I've lost half the audience by now. They don't know what a dial tone is. Their, 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 their life's theme song is do doop do doop do doop do doop do doop. So I'm asking you, do you know what's going on? Brother Bob, why don't you pray for us? Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Okay, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We've been through, we started out with the oldest book in the Bible, chronologically Job, went to the heart of the Old Testament and Chronicles, then we went to the gospel period with the Lord, Matthew. Now we'll go to the last epistle Paul writes before his, he's decapitated there in the Mamertine dungeon. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the last book he writes. No chapter and verse divisions in the autographs, and so it's one long letter as you obviously understand. And I want to start here at uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3. And I've, I'm at this church a lot of times through the, over the years now, probably more than most churches where I go. So you know the material I seem to repeat over and over again. It's always been important, but boy, is it ever important tonight. Miss Angie, so glad to see you back. A lot of people praying for you, boy, I tell you. And, uh, I'm so, and back on your birthday, what a blessing. And, um, 2 Timothy 3, 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Somebody mentioned that word this morning in a prayer uh, during Sunday school, I think, these perilous times. You know that word there is the, only, this is the only passage in the Bible where that word is used. God puts that in the Bible one time. That's significant. And if you look it up in the English dictionary with Webster's, it says dangerous, hazardous, full of great risk. Doesn't that sound like global conditions tonight with lost people running for their lives with this pandemic? I mean, this pandemic, amen? You notice they're all panicked? Sounds exactly like that definition, doesn't it? Dangerous, hazardous, full of great risk. 
That's what the book says you have to pass through before you blow out of here if you're privileged to be in that last generation. I'm pre-trib, so am I. But you're not pre-perilous times. Well, you're going to go out of here with the undertaker before we get into those last days where you might get out of here alive. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's a gen that's a good nursery verse. You know that, right? Hey, we're getting out of here. Somebody's getting out of here without dying. But you're not going to get out of here without going through the perilous times. You, how many times have I preached this over the years when it was yawn time, but now it's, duh, it's right in front of your face. Timeline. Creation, crucifixion, coming this way. Here we are now. How many times have you heard me say through the years that I'm not worried about that eruption over here of the Lamb's wrath in that time of Jacob's trouble because of that interruption of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 is going to take us out of here. However, with 16 grandchildren, three in heaven and 13 running around down here, I am concerned a little bit about that disruption that's going to break out right on this side of that interruption because of all that corruption that's been sown into the modern Bible of the Month Club Laodicea and Church Age time period. Well, 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 what, what disruption? You just read it. This know also that in the last days, when Paul had no clue when that was going to be, he thought he was going up at the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he wrote that. God never told him how long things were going to be. And now he thinks, well, I don't think I'm going to make it. I can hear him sharpening the blade down there. I'm ready. I'm out of here. But Timothy, he's probably going up. And he's telling Timothy what to look for in the last days. Timothy didn't know it would be another 2,000 years almost. This know also that in the last days, and you could put in the Greek, whenever that is, perilous times shall come. You understand that? How many times have you read that verse through your life, Christian life? Oh, okay. You know. But now you're starting to see the, the door cracking. Anybody that's older than me, I'm 68 years old in November. You're older than me. This lady here is probably a little older than 68. Hello. Who was president when you were born? What have you ever seen anything like this? Nobody has. Young people, I grew up as a kid always seeking advice from older people. I lived with older people all the time, especially guys. I'd, I'd hang out with older men all the time and learn things. Ask people what they're, what they're looking at. They're, we're all dumbfounded. If you can't tell something's going on, you're crazy. I was preaching on the streets in Branson, Missouri a couple of weeks ago, and the people are just blaseing around, you know, tourist town, and I finally got mad. I just started yelling, hey, don't get nervous. <laughs> don't get excited. There's nothing to get shook up about. The world's just starting to come to an end, that's all. <laughs> I told that to my wife when I got home, you know. She said, well, I'm sure everybody took notice after they heard you say that, right? <laughs> just kept going by. Okay, turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. And by the way, I said that little door is cracking open right now, you know. It's just beginning, you're just starting to see some stuff. And I remember, I've shared this, I'm sure, with you before, one of the funniest things I ever heard Dr. Ruckman say when I was first saved. He talked about a cartoon in Mad Magazine that was very popular during World War II. You know, the people in those days were funny. I, I got two World War II jokes in my book on Israel uh, that they were telling, your grandparents' generation were telling uh, about it Italian jokes. You think I tell Italian jokes? They've always been telling Italian jokes. Uh, two of the jokes here, they, the American GIs were telling, uh, number one, why does the modern Italian Navy prefer glass bottom boats? Anybody ever heard that joke? So they can avoid the old Italian Navy. Say amen right there. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, the other one was, how many gears does an Italian tank have? And the answer is five. One forward and four reverse. Okay, ha, ha, ha. And uh, this cartoon in Ma World War II era Mad Magazine cartoon had this B-52 bomber pilot, and I shared this with that uh, airline pilot I was sitting next to yesterday, and you know, holding on to the controls of his plane, and the uh, cockpit was smoking out, bullet holes all through the windshield, and his uh, co-pilot's laying there half dead, bleeding out of the mouth, and the caption has the pilot saying to the co-pilot, if you think this is bad, wait till we get out of the hangar. Say amen right there. <laughs> I mean, you haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet, neighbor. 
So Romans 6, I, I know I've shared this before, but you have a good church like this. You see, it's always new people here. This church always, this church always looks stronger and a little larger than it was the last time I was visiting. God's hand is on this church. You got a bunch of men in here who are mature, who are following the pastor and leading, giving leadership to everybody in the church. They went after Saul, a band of men whose hearts the Lord touched. You're extremely spoiled here in a nice way. Don't lose sight of that. Uh, I'm somewhere every week of the year. I'm always somewhere. And I see churches every place. You are extremely blessed here. Pastor Gunther, where you at? Can I stay here? <laughs> And uh, so you got new people, you know, there's going to be stuff that you haven't seen before. New people have, the old people have seen it. All right, look at Romans. Uh, you know the Bible, uh, Romans 6, you know the, the numbers in the Bible are significant, right? And Romans 13, uh, Revelation 13 tells you the number of the beast is, is, is number 666, and it's called the number of a man. So you know that. The numbers in the Bible have a strong significance, okay? So, you know, man is created on the sixth day, duh. The sixth book of the Bible is the book of Joshua. It's the first book of the Bible named after a man. It has happened to have six letters in the name Joshua. And the sixth book of uh, the New Testament is the book of Romance. Amen. Anything about man and romance, you know. Again, I've shared this two or three times over the years. And then uh, how many letters in Romance? Well, six. And then, uh, and then uh, hey, you're in the sixth book of the Bible, Romans. You're in the sixth chapter, right? So what verse do you think we should look at? Duh. All right, look at verse six. And if you're a new Christian, or I haven't seen this before, go read the sixth verse. You want to see a coinky dinky? Tell me what the sixth word is. You're at, you're at, Rome, you're at uh, 666. How do you like those apples? And uh, if you get an NIV Bible, so-called, you know, it's all fouled up. Here's exactly what it says. Uh, for we know that our old, sixth word is old, and the next word is self. They add an extra word, and they change the word man to self, twice destroying that beautiful English nugget. God just throwing a little bit of a dessert item out there just to be a blessing to you. And that's why you have to distance six feet. And no unsaved person understands that. Six is the number for a man. And what's that got to do with your outline this morning? It has everything to do with it. It says perilous times are coming, yes? Dangerous, hazardous, full of great risk. Any lost man outside of Michigan here, hasn't been in the church in his whole lifetime, never read the King James Bible, is familiar with an expression called deep six. You deep six something, you terminate it. Because when you kick the bucket, they put you six feet under. Say amen right there. And nobody knows why that is. By the way, somebody was asking me the other day about cremation versus burial, probably one of the most uh, controversial topics in the world. Yeah, I know, but there might be a Bible insight to it. And if you're a Viking, you know, it would be, it would be totally normal. But, I mean, if you want an insight to that, and everybody, I had a sister cremated six months ago. My half-brother was cremated after the shot to death by the Miami Police Department. So we all have people that have been cremated. But the other day I was reading about Moses uh, burying, uh, being buried by the Lord. Wasn't that interesting? I thought, good night. He didn't cremate Moses. He buried Moses. Isn't that something? And that gave me a little bit of insight. I know it's cheaper. I know. <laughs> Don't get nervous. Don't, everybody has somebody that's been cremated. I'm just, you might want to be, if you're a Bible believer, you might want to get as close to the Bible on everything as you can. Thank you very much. I, uh, there goes the love offering. Amen, Brother Green. All right. The first point in the outline is deep six. Deep six. There's going to be plenty of death between now and the rapture. And I'm telling you, neighbor, there's going to be plenty of death. God gave you a word that means dangerous. Hazardous. Hey, a couple in my state in Tennessee went to church a couple of weeks ago. On the way to church, some nasty, filthy thug Hamite ran into the back of their car. The poor guy gets out being innocent, and the guy pulls out a gun, takes him captive, shoots the guy, kills him, and, 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 and I mean, shoots his, uh, I think he shot his wife and killed her, and no, killed him and spared his, and he, before he could kill his wife, the show, cop showed up some, and he killed himself. Indianapolis, Indiana, the week before that, another man is going, driving down, a missionary is driving through the streets and he uh, got a flat tire there on, on interstate, on an interstate in Indianapolis. Called his wife, she came, him, uh, she came over to bring him some tools with the little kid in the car while he's changing a flat tire. Two other thug hamites show up and shoot him 
right in, uh, shoot, shoot uh, her right in the head, right in front of uh, her child in a car, kill her, shoot him in the head. Last I heard, he's hanging on for his life. I don't know whatever happened to him. All over America tonight, that's what's going on. We're starting to get into that shaky period where law and order is a joke. You all see that. I appreciated seeing all those police things yesterday because I have a son who's a, a, a private investigator for the sheriff's department. I have a son-in-law who's a, 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 a guard at the local prison, a corrections officer, and they've got unbelievable stories. A couple of years ago, my son had a man die right in his arms, one of his fellow officers in a shootout, some hillbilly. Going to be plenty of death between now and the rapture. I am a, Brother Gunther. I believe with all my heart Brother Ruckman used to say this and years ago, and I thought, ah, he's pushing the envelope there to myself. But I'm thinking right now, there's at least a 50-50 chance you could have a nuclear war between now and the time we get out of here. I believe that. You think China's going to roll over and play dead when Trump tells them to go take a flying leap about the money we owe them now after this uh, trillion dollar loss is computed on the COVID mess? Death, plenty of death. Now, when you talk about death, and you see what's, ha what's starting to happen now, is this a part of it? Then the implication is the judgment's being is put out by God. Then the Facebook lights up. That's the ultimate soapbox for people. Do you know that Facebook? Everybody's got an opinion. They can't wait to tell everybody how, what they think about everything. So lots of, lots of debate about that. And here's one of the, here's the main argument that this is not, this is quinky dinky, everything that's going on. And God couldn't be bringing any judgment on the country, right? Even though the Bible says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, and the wicked shall be cast into hell, and all nations that forget God. You know, China is incapable of forgetting God. India is incapable of forgetting God. Africa is incapable of forgetting God because they never knew God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. Billion people are going out the gate at the beginning of the tribulation period. You know who they're going to be? Canadians, Americans, Britons, crazy New Zealanders. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Isn't that what Peter said? So the argument comes up like this. Well, if COVID-19 could, could put was a judgment from God, how come good Christian people get it and die? And how come lots of wicked people don't get it? That's the Christian's approach all the time. You know, neighbor, if God lets a saved person get sick and die, don't you know it's a great testimonial in a hospital to lost medical personnel when they see saved people, uh, uh, you know, Praising God, the last enemy is death. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Last enemy is death. And they watch saved people go into eternity, smiling and singing. They get shook up bad. Anybody can tell you know anything about hospital workers. God just gives another Christian another chance to testify for him. They made, uh, well, some skeptic said to John Wesley one time, uh, he said, you know, your followers are a little too emotional. And Wesley said, you're probably right, sir. But they dies well. <laughs> I have a lady in a church in Missouri where I preach a lot, a, a widow lady, a real nice lady, but she's tough as nails. Got a thousand guns in her house, got a gun rack on her pickup truck, and a granny on the belly hillbillies. She's a funny lady, but she got a bumper sticker on a truck and it says, you've all seen it, Jesus is coming soon, and boy is he mad. When he's mad, look out. He, a lot of good people get whacked around. And Dr. Ruckman used to say, did it ever occur to you? Dr. Ruckman used to say, did any babies die in the flood? I never got over hearing that. Yes? Okay, let me ask you this. You remember Joshua's orders when he went into Canaan? What did God tell Joshua to do? He said, don't let anything that's breathing live. Now, did you ever think through that? There's Joshua's soldiers cutting the throats of two-year-old little Canaanite girls that never didn't know what day it was yet. Can't hear you. You're all coughing and gagging at the same time. Maybe, maybe Joshua had the, the Israel, the Jewish women kill the little girls. Somebody killed them. That's not the God of Joel Osteen, is it? That's not even your God, hardly, if you think it through. But that's what he's like. 
Don't get, up, don't get on his bad side. Ain't that something, Brother Grady? Yeah, Brother Grady, that's pretty cool. Joe Boyd said, if they don't amen me, I'll amen myself. Amen. Okay? And you know how God judges people, by the way? There's all kinds of ways God judges. One way is sowing and reaping. If this COVID-19 mess is not uh, a pandemic, it's just an accidental thing, a real accidental flu, it's just part of the, the cursed earth then that we're dealing with. That's a sowing and reaping of, the, of sin, right? Every normal flu bug is a result of a cursed earth. Uh, my uh, my uh, sister had, uh, I mean, my wife had two brothers and, a, and of course a daddy. The daddy died of lung cancer, D-Day survivor, but he smoked too many cigarettes. One brother died of drug, over, uh, drug abuse, stroke or prematurely, and the other one died of cirrhosis of the liver, too much drinking. That's why Ecclesiastes says, why wilt thou die before thy time? America is messed up right now. And these inner cities are completely messed up and looking like they're under judgment, but half of it's because of their own policies. And you got Democrat, you got liberal uh, voting records and you bring in a bunch of crazy people. Next thing you know, they're wanting to send us, you know, a counselor out when somebody's breaking into your house. They're gonna pay the price for that. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Another kind of judgment, and people don't think about this one very often. You know, it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When America was founded, look, somebody said one time that Judaism was the stalk on which the rose of Christianity bloomed. And that's what we had when our country was founded, right? Based on principles of the Bible, and God gave us the Baptist to put the, the Bill of Rights through. And we've got a, a, a sensational start that no country's ever had. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Look, but 250 years later, the Americans, told, Americans now are telling God basically to get lost. See these stupid women out in California holding the signs, we don't want God in California. <laughs> He's the one that can put the fires out or keep them from burning. Or give the people enough sense to put in conservative legislators so they'd have the forest cleaned up. But anyway, Look at here, here's a good way that God can judge a nation, look. That's how he judges. You don't want me, okay. Uh, help yourself. You know, that, that, that's, he didn't, the Lord, God doesn't have to do that to America. He's just gotta do this to America. Duh. Do you know, if, you, if you're not any more spiritual than you know how, you know how to play Pac-Man, you can understand what I just told you. Pac-Man is the only video game I've ever no, known anything about. And I didn't, I didn't play Pac-Man two minutes in my entire life, but I have an idea what it is. I remember seeing these things, right? That's the only video game I've ever seen. Now, I'm not gonna put a diaper on so I can sit on a stool for 36 hours on a video game marathon. Okay, that's what young people and young adult men are doing all across America. Going to diaper, uh, wearing diapers to be at uh, video marathon so they don't have to go to the potty for like a day and a half at a time. That's where America is. Duh! Um, what do you mean Pac-Man? Did you ever read over there in Malachi chapter 3 about tithing? I've been saved 46 years. I've preached, I think, one sermon on tithing. Brother Bob, you remember when I was preaching to you guys over there? I, don't, I only preached one sermon and I was against it, amen. In a sense of beating people over the head, you gotta give. God doesn't need you to be beat into giving to him. Are you crazy? Did it ever occur to you that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? I, you know, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee, he says. So uh, God expects you to give freely. But in the Old Testament Israeli economy, he put the hammer on the people. And in Malachi 3, what does he say? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now. Herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And, did you ever read the rest of the verse? I'll also do something else, he said. I'll rebuke the devourer. Those are those black cancer cells in your body that every, saved, every human being in America has, but you got those little white cells in there that eat the black ones. That's Pac-Man, amen. God said, if you tithe, I'll rebuke the devourer. You don't tithe, I won't rebuke the devourer. No white cells, God take his white cells and go home. And there's the black ones in there. <laughs> Pac-Man, coming after you. Ever heard a sermon on tithing with an illustration like that? I'm telling you, neighbor, 
He's the one that keeps your car from breaking down more than it needs to. You know, you're going to have that hole in the, that bag with the hole in the bottom of the bag. You ever read about that? Your money keeps disappearing. But, but, but then also the Lord knows how to judge straight on in there. Sodom and Gomorrah, all through the Old Testament, illustration after illustration. Individuals. There's old King Herod there in the book of Acts. One, he didn't give God the glory and God just give him worms. Boom, just like that. You don't think God can do that stuff and does that stuff? He does. It's a sad reality, but he does. Judgment. You know, so, so what's that got to do with anything? Okay, you got all this. Remember back in March and April when things were going crazy in New York and stacking up dead bodies? Remember all that? The three hospitals were going crazy. Mount Sinai, Lenox Hill, and I forget the name of the third hospital, somewhere out in Queens. Those were the three epicenter hospitals. Well, Kowinky Dinky, yours truly was born in that center hospital, Lenox Hill. November 7th, uh, 27, 1952. I lived seven tenths of a mile from that hospital. And it's 77th Street and Lexington Avenue. And why do you think New York City had more deaths two to one, 10 to one over any other normal city in the country? You know, New York and New Jersey are the two main states that had the highest death rate. New York was far above New Jersey even. Why is that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, here comes a quinky dinky. Uh, Governor Cuomo gets a, gets a pink tie on, pink tie, to sign that abortion bill for nine months full-term babies getting wiped out when Albany and New York passed that bill. And he lights up World Trade Tower 1 pink to celebrate. I wonder what he thought about that. We already got 50 million butchered babies. And let me tell you something, neighbor. Uh, the airline pilot, you know, the bombers in World War II killing people from 30,000 feet, they never bothered them. But these, get, these American GIs one-on-one -on -one bayoneting people, that's different. You're killing them from 30,000 feet, it doesn't seem as bad. For years, I've been knowing abortion was wrong just because it would be wrong. But not until modern times now with Facebook, when things flash across my screen that I didn't know were coming, and it's a, nine, a little fetus, I don't even like that word, of a nine-month-old nine dead baby. Oh, I can't, st I, I fall apart. And I'm not the least bit ashamed to tell you, I cry like a baby when I see that. I cry right now thinking about it. I can't believe it's that terrible. And I've always been against it. That's the only redeeming quality of this new Supreme Court nominee, anti-abortion. Death. Going to be plenty of death. Go back to 2 Timothy. Let me jump quickly to the second point. First, first point is deep six. Watch out, neighbor. You're going to see plenty between now and when God wraps this thing up. Well, why are you telling me that to remind you that you better be spiritual now? Well, you won't be able to deal with it. That's, the, that's no more time to fool around. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, you look at verse 2. The first word says, for, for men shall be, blah, blah, blah. Now they list 20 signs to look for. And notice, young people, the first one says, uh, they, uh, uh, they shall be lovers of their own selves. Look at that. 2,000 years ago, the Holy Ghost told Paul to put that in there. Look. He said, when you're not to know you're in the last days, look for a generation that's lovers of their own selfies. How funny is that? And I, I set it up there at Boyne City. Get ready to laugh. Get ready to laugh quick. You've heard this already. Hey, I said, uh, don't get too impressed with these phones because uh, Moses was downloading data onto his tablets from a cloud a long time before the perverted Silicon Valley was ever here. Amen. We're not ignorant of his devices. Let Satan get the advantage over us. So the first thing God tells you to look for is lovers of, you, of their own selves. And he got 20 signs there. Well, one of them says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You got a TV show on ESPN called The Religion of Sports. Without natural affection. That's mothers, is it normal to kill your babies? Well, they're doing it now. Is it normal, dads, to shoot your children and your wives and turn the gun on yourself? Your whole life's purpose is to protect your family. Is it normal for perverts like Stephen Anderson to lead Baptist congregations to turn against the state of Israel and to hate those Jews? Is that natural for Baptists to hate God's people? These are without natural affection times. It's crazy. 
But now, now watch. Let me give you a great truth here. When you jump over to Matthew 24 sometime and you see Jesus on the Mount of Olives talking about the end days, right? He talks about the signs of the times. And what do you remember hearing always? Remember? Wars, rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes, right? And here Paul gives 20 things to let you know when you're in the last day. Same concept. And here's the dilemma. The, the most sincere Christian people can scratch their head at a time like this. And they usually have the same question. How can, what does that mean? Haven't there always been wars and famines and earthquakes? So what kind of a sign is that that the Lord's coming? I mean, isn't that an interesting thought? And that throws Christians. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, and any mother in this room, any mother in this room can give you some insight into that dilemma. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, real quick. Blah, blah, blah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Look, look, neighbor, as travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Hey, what did he say in Genesis chapter 2? In, in sorrow shalt thou conceive? And what did Jesus say in Matthew 24 when he pointed to all those signs he just laid out? He said, all of these things are the what? The beginning of sorrows. So what does that mean? Ask any mother in the room about those labor pains. And the, uh, they, ask them if they don't intensify as you get closer to the delivery. And all of these things have been around. But as you get close to the end, you're going to see these things intensify like the labor pains quicker and quicker and more severe and, and, until that baby's born. And you're going to know there's a difference. That's why I said there's always been wars. Have there ever been nuclear wars? Two bombs dropped on one country. How about missiles flying all over the place? That would kind of stake up the intensity of wars, wouldn't it? And I bet your quarter God's got a few more earthquakes around. That he's going to hit a button on pretty soon. You're going to see all that stuff, see? Now, all that to say this. There's a sign in here I want you to look at. It's about, what about this COVID-19 now? Is it a pandemic or a pandemic? Where did it come from? Is this, something, is this some kind of a, 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 a conspiracy? <laughs> you want to see a funny word God put in there 2,000 years ago? 2,000 years ago, God had Paul write a word down here. Paul had no clue what it would have to do with anything. But we're there now. We're, we're a lot closer to the last days than Paul was, right? All right, ready, neighbor? There's 20 signs listed right there, and starting at verse 2. I want you to tell me what the, what the 15th sign is. I'll tell you exactly where it is. Are you ready, neighbor? It's the first word of verse 4. <laughs> what is it? Traitors. Say, have mercy, preacher. Where'd that come from? Yeah, that's the Holy Ghost. He said, you'll know you're in the last days when you see traitors running amok. In the Greek, preacher, it's rhino Republicans and never Trump Republicans and Nancy Pelosi's and crazy people that are all over the place now that you've never... Hey, John F. Kennedy's generation looking really good right now. Tip O'Neill's looking real good right now. Work with Ronald Reagan all the time. What do we got going running wild all of a sudden? Now look here. Remember the principle about the birth pains? When America was founded, you had traitors back then, but they were in the minority. Those loyalists that were opposed to the rev revolution, they were right out in the open forever. We're not going to revolt. Traitor is somebody that's with you one minute and turns on you. Like Benedict Arnold, anybody remember him? Yeah. But bums like that were in the minority. The exception to the rule. The rule were men like Nathan Hale, uh, the, the school teacher. Remember, we grew up hearing about people like that. You think any of these kids in America has ever heard of him now in school? That's the school teacher in Connecticut that was a spy for Washington, and he got caught and he got hung. And his last words on the scaffold were, I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. That was the norm back then. 250 plus years later, guess what? It's reversed. Men like Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina, known as Senator No, because every time the UN came up, can we? No, he said, no. They said he was the most patriotic uh, congressman we ever had. And he was a saved man. He was a strong Baptist from Raleigh, North Carolina. He loved God. 
And God took them out right before Obama, died right before Obama got elected. He said, Jesse, I can't let you see this. Guys like Jesse Helms and now President Trump, they are the exception to the rules, these patriots. And the, and the rule is the deep state. That's my second point. Deep six, and now we're going to have deep state to deal with. Hey, don't you think the Antichrist is going to be a collaborator and get the whole world on? Uh, we looked at that verse in Sunday school in Isaiah chapter 10. He's got the whole world under his control. You think that's going to happen overnight? Listen, man, that's my other Joe Biden impersonation. <laughs> I was in some church last week and I was patting a little five-year-old kid on the head and I, I got scared. I said, man, that's another Joe Biden impersonation. <laughs> Do you want to hear something funny? Do you know his wife, Dr. Jill Biden? I, her husband, her first husband and, and her, they, they built the most... They built the most popular college nightclub in America in 1972. It's called the Stone Balloon in Newark, Delaware, Rolling Stone magazine, rated it the most uh, popular college nightclub in the whole country. Bruce Springsteen appeared there, Ray Charles, the Almond Brothers. It was a going and blowing operation, I'm telling you, neighbor. We're on Main Street, right by the University of Delaware, and you won't believe this, but in two weeks before they opened up, I'm sitting in that joint on a bar stool, with a Carpenters are carrying boards around and finishing up the place. I'm sitting on the bar stool with Joe Biden's husband, filling all the paperwork out, selling them all their cash registers. I wasn't old enough to drink in this stinking hellhole. I was 19 years old. Can you believe that? Wasn't that an interesting story? Okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in G Listen, if you go over to Matthew 4, don't turn to it for time, but you got Jesus talking to the devil. Remember what the devil says to Jesus? He shows them all the power and the glory of the world, and he says, all this is mine. Dr. Ruckman said he won it in a crap game. Adam lost it to, to the devil, and now he's the God of this world. He got it all. And he said, but I also give it to whosoever I will. Is that what he said? Do you know those same unsaved men in Michigan that never visit this church? are familiar with not only deep state, but they're familiar with another expression, sell your soul to the devil. You ever heard that? You know, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards both turning 76 or 77, I forget, this year. Keith Richards said, we're going to rock forever. They're grandparents. How do they have that staying power? One day they're going to have to pay the piper for it, say. You know, Keith Richards is so filthy and so perverted. His father died and father got cremated. Keith Richards snorted his father's ashes with cocaine mixed in with it. That's how sick that world is out there. Selling your soul to the devil. The deep state. So who's behind the coronavirus? Was China behind that? Are there any legitimate conspiracies? See, listen, neighbor, don't get mad at me, but I don't think the earth is flat. Stupid. Is this on tape? Are we on Facebook? You got a donate button on this thing? I hate preaching for nothing. Deadbeats on internet never pay anything. I always say stuff like that to keep the fan mail coming in. Amen. <laughs> hey, and I think we went to the moon. Say amen on that one. And I think Sandy Hook shooting was real. I don't think it was an act, a fake thing. Duh. But there's plenty of real conspiracies that have been all over this country, all through the world. That's the way the devil runs things, okay? Uh, let me show you something. I gave you this stuff years ago here. It's coming through, the, through, through this church, right? You've seen this, the Pearl Harbor news, uh, headline of the newspaper, the largest newspaper in Hawaii when Pearl Harbor was bombed. How many times have I showed you this? That's why I'm telling you, you should get this book to people, into people's hands. It'll blow their mind. They yawn in the old days. Now they're paying attention. Here's the front page of the Honolulu Advertiser, seven days before Pearl Harbor was bombed. Japanese may strike over weekend, right on the headline, right there. I paid $250. I've been in the newspaper office in Honolulu. I've got the microfilm in my office. This is not goofy uh, fake news. Here's the, here's the article. Leaders call troops back in Singapore, and they got an article right here, and they got four little bullet headlines, and the fourth bullet headline says, Hawaii troops alerted. Three words right there. There's the date, November the 30th. That's some sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. That's the deep state. 
That's what, this is, that's what this is all about. And here's the page right in front of it, and I've shared this with you before. It's a full page from the Federal Register, page 9097. This was entered November the 7th, 1942. I said, where'd you get it, Brother Grady? On the internet? No, I got it mailed to me by the Library of Congress Law Department, you know, with an envelope and a stamp on it. Here's a whole article about one of the biggest banks in New York, the Union Banking Corporation of New York that got busted in the middle of World War II. They got caught money laundering for Hitler. And the Third Reich, their, their assets were frozen under the authority of the Trading with the Enemy Act. You just got to do your own reading. Now, that's a bad enough thing, but that wouldn't shock too many of you men. Maybe you've had corruption in the government even during World War II. But the board members of the bank are listed right there. It is one of the seven names, Prescott Bush. That's 41's daddy, soon to be the Honorable Prescott Bush, Senator from Connecticut. That's the family that wouldn't spin on Trump in 2016. But they had no trouble keeping Mr. Hitler in business. That's in the official record of the government. That's the deep state, things people never see. Let me show you something really crazy. Now, for a long, I've shown you several times the, the man that invented the craziest weapon in the history of mankind, the neutron bomb. Here's a picture of him and me and him in his backyard. A congressman from Oklahoma named Charles Keek put me in touch with him and we became closest friends. He phoned my house or my cell phone once a week for seven years in a row. I, I've been in his home and God linked us up and I've been witnessing to him forever. He, went, he died the other day of stomach cancer, but he, he worked on the atom bomb in 1943 and invented the neutron bomb. In 1958, I've shared that many times with you, but for a reason, I want to show you something I've never read to you before. Here is his afterward right here, the back of this book. He's a Jewish atheist, but it's a pro-Israel book, and he's wanting to promote it to help uh, get the information out, and that endorsement got me a plug in USA Today, if you can believe that. But here's something I've never read to you before, and if you've read the book, if you've gotten to the end of it, you may not, you may not have even read this. Don't miss what you're about to hear. Most Americans are totally oblivious to their precarious surroundings. Several years ago, my longtime friend and colleague, Joe Douglas, authored a book, America the Vulnerable, The Threat of Chemical and Biological Warfare, whose preface contained the following statement. Here's the cover of, the, of that man's book, it's the Statue of Liberty with a gas mask on. Now, don't even miss this, and please don't fall out of your chair and hit your head and cause a lawsuit. While the United States debates the development of a massive defense effort against nuclear attack, the fact remains that this nation is almost entirely defenseless against chemical, biological, and toxin weapons of mass destruction. Some of these weapons may already be secreted within our borders. Others could be synthesized by our enemies within a matter of days, I mean, hours or days at the most. Indeed, it is doubtful that most biological attacks would even be recognized for what they are. Even if it could be proven with certainty that the outbreak of a particular disease was not a natural occurrence and instead was deliberately instigated, it would be almost impossible to pinpoint the exact source." End of quote. Now, this book came out in 2005, and this man's book was already out years by that time. Hey, you want to see some crazy stuff, neighbor? Here's a book right here. The author's name is Dean Koontz. Front page cover, a photocopy of the book right there. It's called The Eyes of Darkness. This book came out in 1981. It was a fiction book about a campsite where there's a murder. You know, nothing to do with us. But in the book, it deals with a pandemic virus that goes around the world. Here's a page from the book. The Russians called the stuff Gorky 400, that's a city in Russia, because it was developed at their RDNA labs outside of Gorky, and it was the 400th viable strain of man-made microorganisms created at that research center. And then it goes on to explain all the uh, stuff that basically we're dealing with tonight, as in 1981. Listen, do you ever pray to the Lord? I do. Well, Satan is the god of this world. Don't you think his, his most faithful disciples communicate with him, talk to him? And he answers their prayers, but he usually gives them goofed up information. Some accurate, some inaccurate. You ever notice that? Now look, watch this neighbor. A man put out an, uh, another edition of his book in 2008, 1981, 
2008. Here's a page, photocopy, page 555. They call the stuff Wuhan 400 because it was developed that there are DNA labs outside the city of Wuhan. And it was the 400th viable strain of man-made microorganisms created at that re research center. Wuhan 400 is a perfect weapon. It afflicts only human beings and on and on it goes with many factors right on the money. Some off, many on the money with what we're dealing with tonight. But that ain't, it, that ain't nothing. Look at this witch over here, a psychic gal. Her name is Sylvia Brown. Here's her book, come out the same year. This guy changes his book to the Wuhan for the same year, 2008. Here's the front cover of her book. The End of Days, Predictions and Prophecies About the End of the World. In and around the year 2020, <laughs> a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking the lungs and the bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Almost more baffling than the illness itself will be the fact that it will suddenly vanish as quickly as it arrived, attack again 10 years later, then completely disappear. These are the unsaved people that worship him, worship him, I mean. And they get insights. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. And by the way, here's a movie came out in 2005 called V for Vendetta. Wouldn't recommend you watch it, it's a pretty rotten movie. But talks about a virus going all around the world, started in Britain. And it's a, it's a conspiracy, and they're trying to scare the people through the press releases. And that, that pandemic is supposed to come out in the year 2020, according to that film in 2005. You know, you know me, I do my research, I try to. I don't believe in silly things that aren't true. I'm just telling you, neighbor, don't be shocked if the devil's working behind the scenes in a deep state, which brings to the point three, Turn to 2 Timothy. We're rounding third base now and heading to home plate. These last two points just take a couple of moments and we're, we're done. I want to leave an outline on your mind that you can't. That's the third time I grab my nose like that. And every time I do it, I'm, I'm aware that half the crowd is having heart failure. Look at, what's he, you know, in the old days you could do that. It didn't matter. But now I'm all right, brother. Men don't, don't usually care about stuff like that. All right. Second Timothy, you're going, to, you're going to wash this up, right, you, before tonight? Second Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and, and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. You know what that says in the Greek? Pre-COVID, post-COVID. Hello. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay, we're going somewhere now. In, in, in Ephesians, in Corinthians, and I think in Thessalonians, uh, we're, we're not turning to these references now for time. Paul told the church, wake up, wake up, wake up. You ever read that? Okay. That's primarily going to be uh, true in the Philadelphia church age when God opens up a 200, uh, 300, four, almost 400 year period when there's revivals all over the place because God's got the thing going. And, and the Christians are going good and then they fall asleep. And they have to have a revival. What do they call the revivals? Great what? Awakenings. But when you get into the end days that Paul's writing about in chapter 3, verse 1, there's no waking up for the church. It's now it's a deep sleep time. Look at the next verse. Verse 3. Whenever those last days are, Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. How many times have you heard me quote that verse over the years here? The they is not lost people, it's saved people. And did you notice it didn't say they will not, it didn't say they will not believe sound doctrine. They just won't endure it. They believe it, but they won't put up with it. It's too politically incorrect. God help you if you start looking into the racial issue, everything's thrown in your face 24-7. You try to give a Bible response to that, they'll, they'll execute you. Hello, last days, the people are not going to put up with that book. And that's why your auditorium can never be filled up as much as you want it to be. We've talked about that forever. Verse 13 of chapter 3, hello, evil men are going to what? Wax worse and worse. Is that what it says? But what do you mean? You got to quit now because we're in the last days? No. What's verse 14 say? But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned of me. Paul said, keep on a going whenever you're in the last days, even though you can't get those birds to pay attention to you. And they won't put up with it. So you know what I think? The, fourth, the third point of this outline is deep six, deep state. You know what I think it is? Deep sleep. That's that REM sleep. 
You know, oh, wake up, wake up. They, they don't wake up. At the Garden of Gethsemane, hey, they got up. But in the end, they, he's, he's coming as a thief when? In the night. Anybody work midnight shift? Nobody's supposed to be awake at that time. Am I right about it? I worked four years in Bible college at a midnight shift. Okay, neighbor, you know how messed up things are today? You know how messed up they are? I just, came, I just landed at Detroit Airport here yesterday. You know, I was coming down the escalator the other day, coming back from Colorado, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to get a connection in Knoxville. That's when there were about 10 people in the whole airport, in the, you know, in the height of the airport, you know, shutting down. And, and it's like 10 people seem like in the whole airport. I'm coming down this 10 mile long escalator, and there's a big black dude who's about as big as Jack Patterson right behind me. If he wasn't on the step right behind me, he was no more than two steps behind me. I mean, I can hear him breathing down my throat, coronavirus ministry. We're coming down the escalator, I heard grunting back there, and finally I, I turn around and acknowledge his existence. Yeah, how you doing? Hey, hey, bro, he says, and if you told me this, I wouldn't believe it. As soon as he said, hey, bro, he went like this. He pulled a bag out of his pocket, just come back from Burlington, Vermont, that's your day, up. Pulled a bag, he said, hey, bro, you want to smoke some weed, man? A bag of grass in his head, on the escalator coming down. And I looked at him, and you know, Ralph Cramden was my hero growing up on the honeymooners. And I, I, I didn't know what to say. I said, oh, what, are, are you nuts? That's all. I didn't know what his name was. I said, are you nuts? And then for some reason, I said, I'm, and listen, I'm a preacher on top of it. Now, if you told me what he said, I wouldn't believe you. This is what he said to me. This is before we got to the bottom of the escalator. He said, well, I'm a graduate of Liberty University in Lynchburg. And then he said, you know, you know, that's the, the guy, where the guy just stepped down from having a booze in his hand, his pants unzipped, with some floozy in the post, posting it on his own website. You know, Jerry Falwell Jr., anybody home? That, that's, they ought to see it tonight. Then I was in New York the other day preaching up on that Corona crusade. Somebody told me of a, a church to call. They, they'd probably want me in there. I had one open date and I called and I got the assistant pastor on the phone. Then he told me it was a community church, Baptistic, King James, but not a Baptist church by name. And I told him I don't preach in non-Baptist churches. And you know what he said? He said, I don't want you to think we weren't interested in this. Several years ago, a bunch of our men looked into it, turning Baptist. And then when they got into Albany, the capital, they found that the paperwork was gonna cost $1,500 you know, switch, you know, the name legally. And then this is what he said, hey, laughing. And, and that wasn't about to happen. <laughs> and he thinks it's funny laughing to me. You know what I said to him? I said, you ever read about Abraham and the Lord negotiating there about Sodom? 50, 40, 30, 20, hello? I said, what if it would have been $50 for the paperwork? Would you have become a Baptist for 50? That's how much they had a conviction about it. 1,500, no way. <laughs> That's what Laodicea is all about tonight. And if you don't think COVID-19 is spreading in a spiritual sense, it's even up there tonight in the glory world. You want a verse for it? It's over there in Revelation 3. You're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. So what's that got to do with anything? I married a nurse, a, a labor and delivery nurse. And any medical person can tell you in a hospital when they want to induce vomiting, Look at her, how you doing? She ain't taking her eyes off me. When they want to induce vomiting, they use lukewarm water. That's why the next thing says, I spew you out of my mouth. We make God sick up in heaven tonight, in a spiritual sense. All right, I'm all done with this last point. Deep state, a deep six, deep state, deep sleep. And then the last point. Look at 1st Tim, 2 Timothy 4. Verse 3, verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to Lion King. I, I, I mean fables. Oh, here we go again. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Isn't that beautiful? I read that verse to my wife, and you know what my wife said? She said, boy, that sounds like deep space to me. <laughs> I had a three-point outline forever. I just added, I, I couldn't add, help adding that one on. This preacher I preached for in Missouri said, how about deep, deep, uh, uh, deep dish, you know, for the millennium? I said, nice try. It has to be an S, amen. <laughs> 
hey, deep space, we're going out of here pretty soon. I've got a message on the rapture called the trumpet's out of the case. Hey, look, turn to Second Chronicles 20. I'm about one foot from home plate. We're going out of here sooner or later. And it's getting, it's getting sooner and sooner. And uh, I want to show you an encouraging scripture. I, I come across this in my Bible reading the other day. I've read it before. And, and you could, that sermon outlined is Sunday school about all the questions. Here's the last little question, last little thought. We want to go out of here, don't we? We sure do. When are we going out of here? It's getting close. But look, what do we do between now and the rapture? When we get into these perilous times, what if Biden wins, you know? What if Trump wins and there's a riot? You know what I mean? We're all thinking stuff like that. Well, you're not the first generation of God's people to be confused. Anybody ever hear a jump in Jehoshaphat? Amen. Here he is here being surrounded by the Moabites and they're going to get wiped out. And they were paranoid. He's calling on the Lord. Look what he says in verse number 12. One scripture of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? Isn't that how you feel about CNN and, and all the uh, never Trumpers and all the communists want to destroy the country tonight? Antifa and Black Lives Matter and every garbage thing that's attacking everything that's decent. McDonald's and Burger King kissing each other now on advertising. You know, Ronald McDonald clown kissing the king. You ever seen those for LGBT to lip lock? This country's sick and fast, brother. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Look at this. Neither know we what to do. You're not the first person. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? What's the rest of the verse say? But our eyes, what? Are upon thee. And that's why Jesus said over there in the Gospel of Luke, when you see all of these things come to pass, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. That's a tribulation passage, but it's just as good for the rapture portion. Things getting crazy, lift your heads up, he's coming for us. What a good time to get everybody down here. <laughs> Put your heads up. All right, I'm done with this. Turn over to the last book of the Bible. Last verse I have, and I'm going to tell you something now that's going to blow your mind, okay? I want to encourage somebody now, okay? Get ready, neighbor. I'm going to tell you this in closing. See, preacher, this is longer than the 35 minutes. You, you've, I've been coming here since Abraham Lincoln was president, and the world's coming to a stinking end. What are you all nervous about? No more football games you can go to for eight hours, you know, so sit here for a few more minutes, because when do I ever say anything that's not worth hearing? Give me a break. <laughs> Am I right? I'm serious. When do you know, how do you know when a lawyer is lying? You know, when his lips are moving. How do you know when I have something worth saying? When I, my lips are moving. I'm just going to tell you what, and some of the stuff I make up, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but most of it I don't. This is absolutely true what I'm going to give you here. And I'm, I'll, I'll be closing with this right now. I want to encourage somebody. You know, the other day, somebody sent me one of the dumbest things I've ever seen, funniest thing. It was a split screen on crazy Facebook thing, look. It had a picture of Joe Biden over here and Ralph Cramden from the honeymoon was over here. And Joe Biden was running his yap about that Ukraine thing, getting that, that prosecutor fired, you know? <laughs> and what do you know? He gave me the money, you know, we gave, he fired the dude and I gave him the money. And you got Ralph, Ralph over here, the honeymooners, that you young people, I'm sorry, you grew up in Facebook, you missed half the, your life's blessings, you know, by. And, and, and Ralph is doing this, look. He's just making these contorted faces, not saying anything, listening to them. Now, I grew up watching that. I promise my apartment in 323 East 78th Street was just like that. It might have been nastier looking. The window, yelling up outside in the fire. I slept on the fire escape many hot nights. On my mother, I could see her with a broom smashing the ceiling when somebody upstairs was too noisy, banging on the pipes for the you know, superintendent to come and fix stuff. That's how we lived. So I love that show. Now all that to say this, I saw that video and uh, now look, I'm going to show you one little clip of it because I, I am so, go I, I, I say this for the teenagers, I am so going somewhere with this. <laughs> I am so going somewhere with this clip. All right, ready? Trust me. There it is. Now listen, he, he says one bad word on it, Biden does, duh, so I won't let you hear that, I'll block it out. And I was going, supposed to announce that there's another billion dollar You can't see it, just imagine Jackie's and face. I've gotten a commitment 
from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, I said I'm not going to. Or we're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. Well, did I get it? No, I don't think I got it. You I... are a blabbermouth! Hey, Jack, you're a rough friend. You Now, you won't believe the connection to where I'm ending in three minutes. You're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. That's funny. That's how we grew up in, in the old days, when you could tell Pollock jokes and it wasn't a hate crime, okay? Now, all that to say this. I sent that to a bunch of preacher friends. But when I saw it, I felt bad after I looked at it because I remembered something. Jack Howells told us in 1988 in a Sunday night church service, 7,000 people. He stood, he stood at the pulpit and said, you know, last week or so I saw an ad in a newspaper that Jackie Gleason had taken out. He was dying. And the ad said, can anybody tell me how to go to heaven? The June Taylor dancers couldn't help him at that point. And he didn't care about what his celebrity friends thought about him all of a sudden crashing and burning, looking for God. And J Jack Howes and Jackie Gleason, what about that? Jack Howes and Jackie Gleason. Number one soul winner of all times, biggest church in America at once point, right? He tried his best to get through to Ralph Cran, uh, Jackie Gleason. He said, but I couldn't get through the red tape. And he said, he just died yesterday or something, the day before. I remember him telling, I was in the service when he said that, and I felt really bad, you know, in my heart. So I sent this crazy thing out to a bunch of preacher friends, and I got an answer back from a guy in Kentucky who's starting a jubilee tomorrow night. His name is Ricky Prophet. I call him a hillbilly because he's from Kentucky, but he's a sharp King James guy, good guy. And you know what he said? And I'll close with this. He said, I like Jackie Gleason. Several years ago, a man stood up in a service where I was preaching and requested prayer for Jackie Gleason because he heard he was in the hospital dying. At the time, I thought it rather silly. The next morning, I went to work. He's only 20-something years old back then. And I was sitting, drinking coffee, and I picked up a Louisville Courier-Journal newspaper. And the first thing I saw was an article about Jackie Gleason. And it told the hospital that he was in. I told you all that for this. God began to burden me for him all day. I went home and wrote him a letter telling him of the need to be saved and included a simple gospel track. A few days later, I saw on the news that he passed away. About a month later, I went to my mailbox and there was a letter from the Gleason family. When I opened it, all it said was, and here's a copy of the letter, for your prayers and concerns. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Gleason family. And then the preacher ends by saying, I hope that means he trusted Jesus Christ. Who knows? But call unto me and I will answer thee. And the greatest soul winner in the 20th century couldn't get through to him. But a little hillbilly preacher in his 20s in Kentucky, God spoke to him about it. And it got this far. And I don't know if you ever saw Jackie Gleason's headstone. Here it is. It says, and away we go. And I imagine if he did get in, Brother Gunther, the first thing he said when he walked in the door was, how sweet it is. Hey, do you think he's in control? Do you think he can hear you? Do you think he knows what's happening? And this is the thing I'm going to end with. Well, is he coming or not? How soon is he going to, is it, when's he getting here? <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you something as long as you don't quote me on this. Is this on Facebook? If you could edit this little part out, now, of course, I'm just kidding. I don't care about anything. But I was in New Hampshire preaching a couple weeks ago, and a man's wife showed me this. The guy's not even a preacher. And his wife said, Brother Grady, or Brother Bill, she said, you want to see what the Lord showed me this week? Look. 
We're done. You got your Bible? I told you to turn to the last book, Revelation 22. When's the Lord coming back? I, I don't think he can get here soon enough. What do you think? Uh, I think that's what it says here at the end. What's it say in verse 20? You got a Schofield note here, right here, between verse 19 and verse 20. What's the little Schofield note say? The last promise and the last prayer of the Bible. Here we go. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Brother Gunther, why don't you come on up here because I'm done with this. You, I come, look here. Uh, I come, what's the next word? Quickly. Can he get here quick enough? Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Hey, verse 20, and the last verse of the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Hey, if Mr. Trump survives, let's pray that he does. He's going to get inaugurated in January. Hello. Maybe he's going to be the last Trump. Amen. You know what that lady said to me? She said, Preacher, I ain't saying nothing. But what are those last two verses? What's the scripture address? 2021. Wouldn't that be a good time for the Lord to come? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I told you I'm not saying anything. Don't you dare quote me. Jack Howell said when he was a young preacher in Texas in his 20s, everybody was predicting the rapture date, all missing it. He said, I wasn't that dumb, I, but I did say the Lord was going to come back in a particular year he was in. He said, the Lord's coming this year sometime. They said, what happened? He said, December was wild, brother. He said, January was a little tough. Eh? Preacher, come ahead. Deep six, deep state, deep sleep, and deep space. Hey, we don't know what to do. Well, brother, just lift up your heads and look at the one who does. He'll be here soon enough. Hang in there.